Uh, okay. What do you do here? I collect tails and trade them with others who have tails of their own. What about the place? It is part of Mistress Grey's story, which is not mine to tell. She has said that when she nears the end of her years, she shall tell me, and only if I pledge never to share it with another. She hopes that she will never need to tell me her tale, for she hopes I will find my own story before that time and leave this place. I think she fears my life will be squandered in searching for this tale, and not acting upon what I already know. But it cannot be helped. Ah, yes, Eves. You look familiar. Is your mother named Ivana? Eves nods. Yes, but she and I no longer speak, just as I shall speak no more of her. What can you tell me about Echo? Echo? Eves frowns, thinking. I once heard the tale of a girl who knew the word that if spoken would undo the multiverse perhaps this is echo ask dolora though i understand that she sometimes meets with one who knew echo before she stopped speaking what about the veil if shakes her head but marissa's in an inter is it, uh, uh, marissa's is an interesting tale would you hear it yes once upon a time in a world of heroes and a time of petty childish gods there were three sisters cursed with a hideous appearance. They were considered demons by the people of the land and forever shunned. One missed their sister terribly. One missed their sisters terribly, yet left that world with its shame behind, but exchanged the pettiness of a pantheon for the pettiness of self. Okay. Do you know anything about Ravel? The tale of Ravel puzzle while frightener of children begins and ends with the question, what can change the nature of a man? Many were the times she posed this riddle to those who approached her, those who sought to glean from her the strange magics that she alone seemed to possess. All attempted to answer her query, but to no avail. and. They found the price of their wrong answer to be some horrible fate, always more terrible than the last victims. To recount their various torments would be to speak of things that nightmares are woven from. The tale strikes me in this way. Ravel herself knew not the answer to this question, but she lusted for such an answer. Only the why of the matter remained in question. Why did the nature of a man matter to one of the Grey Sisters, especially to one of such power as Ravel. It is said that she put the question to the Lady of Pain, not directly, but shouted it to Sigil itself, daring for the Lady to answer. When no reply was forthcoming, she wove terrible magics that threatened to open the cage and let the fury of the plains roll in like a wave. She received no answer other than banishment. To this day, no one knows the answer to Ravel's question, and now there is no one to petition, for Ravel herself is gone, lost to the plains. Okay. Updated my journal. Wait, there is more. Though my tale ends with Ravel's demise, there are some that claim the hag still lives. There is a silent um, lady here who once talked of such things, but she speaks no longer. Yeah, I asked you about her to you before. If she would speak to you, she might tell you more of Ravel. Okay. May we trade tales? If not, I would like that very much, yes. Ah! Let's tell the story of Rickwind. Eves leans forward as you tell the tale of Rickwind's odiferous course. She seems to devour your every word. As you finish, she smiles at you. I shall remember this tale, and now I have one for you. The Gilded Tale. All right. Upon the plain of his guard is the Gilded Hall, where those sensates that seek the pleasure of gullet and loin can be found. They indulge this 
passions in earnest, never realizing that the doors of the hall never open and that there is no clear path back to the civic festival. They are the unwanted sensates, the ones that do not truly believe in the faction, but instead seek only pleasure for pleasure's sake, are prisoners who do not realize they are such truly prisoners. Okay. What about the alley of lingering sighs? Eves leans forward as you tell the tale of the alley giving birth. She seems to devour your every word. As you finish, she smiles at you. I shall remember this tale. And now I have one for you. Before I begin, I must ask, do you know what a modron is? Not at all. I mean, I've seen some now. Modrons are creatures of total law, almost more machi machinery than living things. There are many different sorts of modron but all have their place in a very rigid, carefully organized hierarchy. So dedicated are they to this system that they cannot communicate with or even consider the existence of moderns who are not their immediate superiors or inferiors. Okay. Then I shall tell you the tale of the clock and the quadron. Okay. Once upon a time, there existed a modron. It was newly created, its logic fresh and untested, and it had come to sigil following the commands of its modern superiors. It knew of nothing but commands and dictates, of obedience and passing along the orders of its superiors. For you see, moderns are only aware of the commands of their immediate superiors. They have no grasp of a higher authority until this one. Okay. One day it came upon a small shop within which there was a small clock that could no longer tell time. It was cracked along the edges, the wheels of its hands broken. The modron immediately set itself to work at getting the parts to fix the broken clock. It made a new wooden housing for the clock's parts, replaced the bent springs, carefully filed and oiled the clockwork machinery, and carved new hands from the sparse metal available to it. The newly repaired clock's precise ticking reminded it of the great gears of Mechanus, and it comforted it as much as anything may comfort a modron. And what the modron never came to understand was that it truly loved this clock that it had worked on, and for reasons it could not explain, elected to remain in sigil and be with the clock for the rest of its years. Oh. Okay. Let's tell the story of... Uh... Let's ask uh, our companions if they have a story to tell. Dako, do you have a story to trade? Dako, not solemnly. I shall impart the tale of... Ach Ali Drowning. That contains the story of Ach Ali, a foolish Jitzerai of meat who had become lost in the chaos of limbo. Normally, a single Jitzerai may use their focus and mental discipline to form the chaos around them into a small habitable environment. Ach Ali, however, asked so many useless and unfocused questions in her quest to return home that her isle of matter dissolved around her and she drowned. Ives smiles. Fascinating, Dakon. Let me share with you and your companion another version of your tale that I have heard. Another version? Dakon looks attentive and perhaps a little surprised. Go on. Ives goes on to tell a different version of the Dakon's tale. Of Dakon's tale in which Akali was driven from the Jitserai city of Srakt Lore for her constant useless prattling. One day she encountered a sladi on his way to the spawning stone. She hastily erected a wall of chaos matter which even the ravenous sladi found difficult to break down. Hungrily, it waited and spoke to her through the wall. She asked it questions and as she became more absorbed in her pointless queries and the sladi's answers, her own wall decayed and collapsed upon her and thus she drowned in the matter of limbo. Ah.
Uh, what about Morte? Do you have a story to trade, Morte? Me? Why do I have to tell a story? I don't know, to know something more about you and then gain some experience as well? Fine, fine. An elderly man was sitting alone on a dark path, right? He wasn't certain of which direction to go and he'd forgotten both where he was traveling to and who he was. He'd sat down for a moment to rest his weary legs and suddenly looked up to see an elderly woman before him. She grinned, toothlessly with a cackle spoke. Now your third wish. What will it be? Go on. Third wish. The man was baffled. How can it be a third wish if I haven't had a first and second wish? But uh, we, when we were looking at the hugs portrait in the museum, we ha I think it was there. We had a memory about her telling presumably us or some other us, some other incarnate. This is your wish then? Or this is your first wish then or something like that? So I'm suspicious here. <laughs> You've had two wishes already, the hag said, but your second wish was for me to return everything to the way it was before you had made your first wish. That's why you remember nothing, because everything is the way it was before you made any wishes. She cackled at the poor Berg, so it is that you have one wish left. All right, said the man, I don't believe this, but there's no harm in wishing. I wish to know who I am. Funny, said the old woman as she granted his wish and disappeared forever. That was your first wish. Gives smiles. An interesting tale, Morte. And now I have one for you and your companion. The Finn's game. Yeah, that was a nice story, Morte. It's that, that guy, whoever he is, was looping then in between three wishes. He remembered who he was, then he didn't want to remember anymore, and then he fell into the loop again. What about the Finn's game? A Finn sometimes wandered the wilderness of a certain prime world in the guise of a friendly old man. One day he came upon some hunters in the wood. What are you doing? the fiend asked. The hunters told him and the fiend nodded. I have never been on a hunt before. The hunters invited the old man to come along and the group eventually came upon a glade where several deer were grazing. The hunters carried crossbows but did not fire and the fiend asked them why. They are unarmed. The hunters chuckled, patting their crossbows. We hunt nothing that does not have the ability to defend itself. After all, what is the sport in that? The fiend nodded at this and promptly gated in three of his fellows. The hunters led them on a merry chase, but eventually they were caught and eaten. <laughs> Perfect. Mm. Let's tell the story actually let's let's learn about our companions. Oh no. I wanted that. So Anna, do you have a story to trade? I I'm uh, no good at telling such things, I'm not, she frowns and weaves her hands as if trying to shoo away. The idea, I don't know, be asking me for such nonsense now. He smiles at Anna, but I would very much like to hear your story. Well, share your story with us, Anna, come on. Come on already, Findling, you already have one tale you won't part with. <laughs> Anna looks uncomfortable, her tail lashing slowly back and forth. Well, I know one story, she suddenly becomes angry, glaring at Eves. But yeah, I might not like it. You won't, so don't be blaming me for your choking out of me. Then go ahead. Anna scowls and finally relents with an exasperated sigh. I heard the story when I was a wee lass. This Berg's walking home real late near Auntie Peak and passes 
an old toothless crow in a dark and otherwise empty street. Where are you going? She asks him. Okay. Home to me wife and keep, he says. Near these lugs, she asks him. Sure enough, he says. So she asks him a favor to take a box she's got to the other spit and give it to the woman there. Now, this Berg's a real sap, too nice to say no, despite the fact he's sure something's not quite right about this old crone, and agrees, but what's the woman's name? He asks. Where does she live? Where should I look for her if she's not by the, by the other spit? The woman hands him the box, a wooden thing wrapped in colored cloth, and tells him to just go, and she'll be there. Finally, she warns him, and whatever you do, do not open the box. So he takes it home with him and hides it in the rafters, thinking he'll bring it by Dadder's pit when it's light out. His wife, though, seeing him hiding the box, gets right jealous, thinking it's a gift for a lover or something, and opens it up as soon as he's not looking. Well, it turns out the box was full of gouged out eyes and severed male things with <laughs> the hair still on them. <laughs> Her scream brought the Berg running. He remembered what the crone said, got right scared and wrapped the box back up. Okay. He went out straight away to the other spit and sure enough there was another old Hagu waiting there for him. He hands her the box and she says to him, this box has been opened and look at it, looked into. The poor Berg tries to deny it, but she gets his, this dreadful look on her face. You've done something horrible, she tells him, then disappears. That done, he hurries back to his keep. He's feeling ill when he gets back and takes to bed. His wife bitterly regretted opening the box and all. But it was too late. Next day he died of a rotting disease and the first things to go was his eyes and his thing. Anna nods grimly, her tail complete. Eve smiles. That was a wonderful tale, Anna. You should never hesitate to share it. Now, I have one for you and your companion. The par parched land. Once, a large village was struck by a terrible draft. A farmer journeyed to the worshipping stone and again implored it as to the cause of the drought. He asked the stone why it did nothing when the fields were par parched and dying, why the animals and the people suffered, why this stone did not a thing. Have we not given enough offerings? The farmer asked, begging almost upon his hands and knees. But the stone did not respond, it merely sat and cast its shadows. <laughs> I would say so. Sometimes they move, sometimes they don't. Mm. <sighs> what about Farod? Eve leans forward as you tell the tale of the fall of Farod. And then. Once came a man who had experienced the most beautiful thing in the multiverse. It was his intention to place the experience within one of the civic festival sensory stones, magical devices which held feelings and memories for an eternity, leaving them for others to partake of. Okay, you didn't tell me the title of this tale, but he, t he thought about it. Wouldn't its being shared dilute the experience, so he held it to himself, precious thing that it was, and aged with the memory. But as he aged, the memory became tarnished and beaten, and he could no longer recall the glory of the experience. Okay, makes sense. What about uh, Ignis? Eve leans forward, and then she tells us the story of the execution. Once a, murder a murderer roamed the city streets, a black-hearted man by the name of Cossacks, he had been blessed by his abyssal mother so that no one could strike him with an intent to harm or they themselves would die. He reveled in his blessing, using it to start fights and murder anyone who crossed his path. 
During one of his murderous rages, he was captured by the Harmonium with nets and brought before the governors. The trial was short, final, yet Cossacks laughed at the proceedings, knowing that no one among them could harm him without dying horribly. At the final day of his trial, he was proclaimed guilty and sentenced to death. Cossack sentence proclaimed by the governors was this confinement for thrice thirty days, during which time you shall give up your life, be declared dead and your body removed when all signs of life cease. Cossacks laughed and dared any of them to try and harm him, yet the court was silent. The mercy killers led Cossacks to their prison and locked him in a dark empty cell. There was no cot, no lights, and the only door was a steel grate in the ceiling. As they lowered him into the cell, the mercy killer told him, In the corner of your cell will you find a chalice, it holds poison, your death will be swift. Aren't you going to execute me? Cossack snarled, snarled at the guard. No one in sigil shall lay a hand on you with intent to harm, came the mercy killer's reply. Then I spit on your cowardice, Cossacks laughed, feeling for the, chalice, for the chalice in the darkness, then hurling it at the wall and shattering it. Its poison dripped from the walls and dried until it was no more. Come then, you will have to try and kill me now. But there was no response from the grate in the ceiling. It was then that Cossacks noticed the cell had no cot, no lights, and no food and water. All that remained was the shattered chalice, the poison gone, and for the first time Cossacks knew the icy touch of death's approach. In twice thirty days, the grate opened and Cossack's body, now cold, was taken from the cell. It had given up its life and the execution had been carried out. Cool. Um, mm, the story of the alley of dangerous angles and she's going to tell the lady Sutor the tale concerns a Sutor of the lady of pain one of many over the years he was a young man who was obsessed with the the mistress of sigil. He saw her everywhere, in every corner of her city. He would hear the rustling of her robes, the scrape of her blades, and grew infatuated beyond all reason. He hoped that if he worshipped her, that he would at least be able to see her, and so worship her he did. He was found dead on the blood-soaked steps of its own home, Grievous stab wounds covering the whole of his body, but his eyes were open wide, and upon his lips was a triumphant smile. Okay. Um, what about uh, the mortuary story? And then she's going to give us chapters of dust. There are chapters in the dead book, the massive tome which the dustmen keep that records the passing of all that lives uh, into the eternal boundary. In this book there are chapters that are not but dust, and it is believed that the, na the names therein are lost souls who cannot die, but must suffer life eternally until history itself dies and grants them release. Okay, I don't know anything about the dream, dream builder yet. So what am I going to tell her? Maybe I should keep that... Uh, that tale for another time. Right. Let's go talk with them. Can I? Dolora. Dolora's eyes flash as she sees you. Did you find him as he agreed to return the kisses to my heart? Oh, uh, no. I need to complete that quest, maybe. What about you, Kesai? Kesai? Kesai. This alarmingly voluptuous woman has a thick mane of wavy raven co <laughs> Really? That's raven colored hair? <sighs> Bluish skin and shimmering crimson eyes like rubies which have fires lit behind them. Though she's not beautiful in the typical sense of the word, her features are exotic and not altogether unattractive. The woman's voice is deep and sensual, and my greetings to you, sir. Her burning eyes roam over you. I'm Kensai Saris, so tell me, what might I do for you, hmm? 
Look at all this money. Uh, anything, Morte cries. Do anything you want to me. <laughs> Cause I love heartily, revealing canines long enough to be considered fangs. She shakes her head and smiles at Morte. Truly, though, please. What can I do for you? What do you usually do for patrons? Talk, of course, usually about dreams, often those um, exciting in nature, but not always. Guess I winks at you, smiling. So, would you like to tell me yours? Don't be shy. I've heard everything you know. I've heard everything you know. Nothing will shock or surprise me, and I so love to hear people's dreams. We can trade if you'd like to, but you must go first. Ah, I want to go to the dream machine, whatever that is, first. Because I pouts for a moment and shrugs, as you like, I'll be waiting if you ever change your mind. Yes. So, let me see quickly. Let's go complete the dream builder. Where do I have to go? To the Civic Festival to do that. Okay, let's start uh, moving, guys. All right. Done. Start moving and... I'm gone. Complete the machine. See what it all is about and then uh, go tell a story and uh, something more. Discuss dreams. Now they just let us enter in any case. All right. Let's go. It's down Done. here, right? Hello, Neil. I've got everything you need here. Take it. Show, um, show me my dreams, then. Updated my journal. The machine requires a bird cage adorned with razors, a fine rod, to mimic the destructive power of dreams and their ability to capture our hearts and imaginations. Search in the siege tower for a cage I have commissioned. How do I get in there? You have proven yourself to be resourceful. Find a way. Really? It, it, it's going on? Hmm. How do we find a way in there? Right. Oh, that, that's not the exit. I don't know. There must be a portal, maybe. Maybe, just maybe. There's an opening up there, but... Maybe we are just supposed not to find the solution now. I'm gone. To all of this. Let's go to the Civic Fest Hall. I don't really want to talk with anybody there. Uh, I suppose it's this one. But I do want to find this guy. Stop staring at my tail, you skull! Splinter. Join me. I know you from somewhere. What is this place? The stone appears as old as the building itself. It looks amused, more a piece of artwork than a ruler's seat. 
guys, um, who, what are we searching for? I have no name. Okay, Merriman. Yes, I have a name. Montag. Quisai. I'm just here for a quick... Uh... Who are you? Jumbo. <sighs> there is another door in here. Oh my god. This place is quiet. Merry man! This man looks like a bitter, cantankerous old codger. His mouth is twisted into a frown that becomes even more severe as he notices you coming his way. Merry man my name may be, but merry I am not. Off with you, young one. No time for the likes of you. He goes into a fit of coughing from the exertion of shooing you away so loudly. Wait, Dolora wanted me to speak with you. Merriman eyes you suspiciously. That's so about what, eh? Mm? Well? She says that you're her first love and that so long as you hold the keys to her heart, she'll never be free to love another. She told you that, eh? I'm surprised. Perhaps living her under Mistress Grace tutelage did not what I couldn't. Started to develop her feelings. In any case, he pats a pocket on his tunic. I won't just give the keys to you. Wait, those are literally the keys to her heart? She's a robot. He nods. That they are. Dolores a construct. Didn't you know that? A creature of sorcery and clockwork mechanics she is. And one of my finest creations, Merriman sighs. But cold, without emotion or character, I brought her to the lady's place and set her so that she could not leave, in the hopes that the constant contact with so many others would begin to develop her own personality. The keys are the tools used to set her. She wants them because she feels that they're limiting her personal growth now, I suspect. Uh, then why don't you just return them to her? Merriman scowls, because I've become a cruel and bitter old man, who sees he can get something out of you like what I want I want to forget I've lived almost 150 years now and I've seen every sensory stone I've cared to I've cared to in this grand hall I've little time left to live and I'm too weak to go out in search of wholly new experiences so I need to find a way to forget them all that way I can start again in my final days how can I help? Updated my journal. I need something, some item, some concoction that will allow me to forget, like a draft of the river sticks, something like that. How do I capture the draft from the river sticks? River sticks. Maybe I should ask Ivana. Ivana, maybe. Uh, it is a chain quest. <laughs> I'm not going to talk with anybody in here um, as of yet because I want to explore this place. Hi. You're still there? Might as well. Yeah, I don't want to explore this place yet. I'm gone. I don't know, maybe I should talk with Ivana. But I have no idea. 